The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello, and welcome to Wonderfully Made. My name is Don Morgan. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I teach at Middle Tennessee State University. This is the sixth program in a series that is devoted to promoting the health benefits of adopting and maintaining a physically active lifestyle. In our last program, we discussed the epidemic of adult obesity in the United States and examine the role of physical activity in combating this chronic lifestyle disease. Today, I want to turn our attention to the prevalence of childhood obesity in America, identify some of the factors which contribute to sedentary living in the overweight child, and then offer some practical strategies that can be used to promote and encourage home and school-based physical activity. As mentioned in the previous program, the United States has the highest incidence of obesity in the world. Adult obesity has risen steadily over the past 20 years, with about 30% of the United States population classified as obese, and another 35% or so classified as being overweight. It should be noted that the prevalence of obesity varies from 25 to 51 percent, with higher values reported in Mexican Americans, African Americans, and Native Americans. In addition, the financial burden that is associated with being overweight and obese has been pegged at $117 billion per year, with over 39 million workdays being lost annually to obesity-related causes. Paralleling the alarming increase in adult obesity over the past 15 years, recent childhood surveys have revealed that the prevalence of overweightness for all age groups has increased markedly over the last 25 years to reach their highest levels ever. As shown in our first graphic, the incidence of obesity in children between the ages of 6 to 11, depicted in the light blue bars, and adolescents, ages 12 to 19, depicted in the purple bars, was relatively stable from the 1960s to the 1980s. There wasn't a lot of change. However, from 1980 on, you can see that the rate of increase in obesity in both age groups has risen dramatically. And currently, 16% of children aged 6 to 19 are obese. This rate is quadruple the percentage seen in the 1960s. Moreover, another 31% of youngsters have been classified as being at risk for obesity. What this means when you put it all together is that 47%, or nearly one out of every two American youth, are either obese or at risk of becoming obese. In terms of the economic cost of childhood obesity, yearly obesity-related hospital costs for children ranging in age from 6 to 17 years more than tripled between 1979 and 1999. What are some of the health risks that are associated with obesity in youth? Adolescents who are obese can develop a negative self-image and a low self-esteem that can persist into adulthood. The observation that heavier children are at greater risk for type 2 diabetes and the fact that hospital discharges of obesity-related diabetes nearly doubled between 1979 and 1999 
This suggests that the disease effects of recent increases in obesity prevalence have already started. Children who are obese are more likely to display an unfavorable lipid profile, featuring higher cholesterol, triglyceride, and low-density lipoprotein levels, as well as lower high-density lipoprotein values. Persistently higher blood pressure levels have also been found to occur nine times more frequently among obese youth. Orthopedic complications, like pain and range of motion limitations, can be a problem for the overweight child, while sleep apnea, or the temporary stoppage of breathing during sleep, is thought to be present in about 7% of obese children. What is the likelihood that an obese child will become an obese adult? According to published data, about one-third of obese preschool children become obese adults, while 50% of obese school-aged children carry their obesity into adulthood. Unfortunately, this figure rises even higher with age, with 80% of obese adolescents remaining obese as adults. To me, these findings provide a strong rationale to launch aggressive measures early in a child's life to promote healthy eating and an active lifestyle. Since being overweight and obese is linked to a number of adverse health consequences, it is important to determine how these variables are calculated. While many laboratory-based methods exist to quantify body composition, the use of the body mass index, or BMI, has become widespread in the past few years because it is fairly easy to determine. All you need is height and weight, and they're very easily measured. And it's been shown to correlate reasonably well with direct measurements of body fat. The following graphic shows how to calculate BMI for a 13-year-old boy who weighs 141 pounds and is 5 foot 3 inches tall. In this example, the first step is to convert height to inches. And we can do that by multiplying 5 feet by 12 inches per foot and adding the extra 3 inches to arrive at a height of 63 inches. Next. You take the 63 inches and you square it. All that means is that we will multiply 63 by itself. In this case, 63 multiplied by 63 gives you 3,969. The next step is to divide the child's weight, which in this example is 141 pounds, by his squared height value, which is 3,969. And when you do all of that, the number you get is a very small one. In this case, 0 0.0355253. The last step is to multiply this very small number by 704.5. Now this number acts simply as a constant value and it's always used. And when you multiply that small number by 704.5, you will get your BMI value which in this example is 25.0. Notice that the units of this number are kilograms per meter squared. In the abbreviation there, it's kg divided by m squared, but that's what that means, kilograms of body mass per meter of height squared. Now I know that for some, all of this might have been a little complicated. So the next graphic shows you how you can determine BMI using tools found on the internet. Simply go to www.cdc.gov forward slash growth charts. Once you're there, just click on Tools to Calculate BMI. And then once you're there, click on BMI Web Calculator. And then simply follow the instructions to derive your child's BMI value. At this point, what you need to do is to translate your child's BMI value to BMI percentiles that are adjusted for age and sex. And you can see this in this graphic here. What you do, again, 
is you go to www.cdc.gov forward slash growth charts. Then you click on clinical growth charts. Then scroll down to children 2 to 20 years. And then finally, click on boys BMI for age or girls BMI for age. When you follow these steps, you will see a plot of BMI percentile curves that can be used to determine your child's BMI percentile based on their age and sex. Once you have this information, you'll want to find out where they fit in relation to existing BMI standards for youth. If your child's BMI for age percentage is equal to or greater than the 95th percentile, your child would be considered obese. If their BMI for age percentile is equal to or greater than the 85th percentile, but less than the 95th percentile, they would be classified as being overweight. If your child's BMI for age percentile lies between the 5th and the 85th percentiles, it is considered to be in the normal range. Youngsters with an age and sex-adjusted BMI in the 5th percentile or lower would be considered underweight. When one looks at variables that underlie obesity and weight gain, heredity is often mentioned as a potential contributing factor. Studies of families have shown that about 25 to 40 percent of the variability in human obesity is related to genetic factors. While acknowledging the influence of heredity on weight gain, much of the increase in obesity over the past two decades has been linked instead to a variety of lifestyle and environmental influences, including less physical activity. What are some of the factors that contribute to a sedentary lifestyle for the obese child? While there is no simple answer to this question, let me offer a few suggestions. First, children and adolescents who are overweight are often the object of teasing, jokes, and ridicule, all of which can help to reinforce a negative body image. This, in turn, may help foster the self-perception that they are clumsy or unskilled, which then further detracts from any joy or incentive they might have to participate in physical activity. Second, just as very young children are much more likely to engage in physical activity if their parents are active, parental inactivity has been shown to be a strong predictor of child inactivity. Third, obese children tend to perceive a given exercise level as being more strenuous than a non-obese child. Consequently, they may be reluctant to participate in physical activity. Television viewing, internet surfing, video games, and the accompanying sedentary behavior they spawn are additional factors that have been linked to reduced activity levels in children. Finally, more states are reducing the physical education requirement at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Where daily physical education was once the norm, many schools now offer PE instruction only once or twice a week. The unfortunate result of this decision is that many students now receive fewer opportunities to be physically active during the school day. Given the potentially damaging effects of childhood obesity, how do we begin to develop strategies to help youth fend off the accumulation of extra weight. Before I discuss some specific ways to address this question, I'd like to talk first about a few basic concepts regarding physical activity and children. Young children are inherently active, as you parents know all too well. Consequently, if you provide opportunities for children to be active, it's a good bet that they will take advantage of them. Unfortunately, the inverse of this statement is also true. In other words, children and youth will learn to be sedentary if they are not given chances to play and to be active. 
Second, many skills used in adult recreation and leisure time activities are acquired during the school age years. As a result, children who don't, for example, learn how to swim or play basketball may be less likely to participate in these activities when they become adults. A third point to keep in mind is that self-efficacy, or a feeling that you can be successful, is strongly related to lifetime adherence to physical activity. And fourth, children who have active parents and family members are more likely to be physically active compared to youth whose families tend to gravitate towards a sedentary lifestyle. Now, using these general principles as a foundation, it is possible to formulate approaches to help families and schools promote an active environment for youngsters. Let's start by looking at ways to foster physical activity at home. First off, replace sedentary activities with more physical options. Here are some examples. Instead of allowing your son or daughter to chat on the telephone or for hours with friends, suggest that they get together and do their chatting while they walk around the block. If your child's playmate doesn't live too far away and it's safe, have them ride their bike or walk to their friend's house instead of getting a ride there. And if your child has been studying or watching television for a while, encourage them to take a physical activity break by shooting baskets in the driveway or taking a five to 10 minute ride around the neighborhood. The point here is to be creative and to realize that ordinary life is full of fitness and activity opportunities. All you have to do is just reach out and grab them. If you are with your children at the mall and you have some spare time, take some detours when walking from one store to the next and expend a few extra calories. Likewise, if you have errands to run in the neighborhood or only need to pick up a few items at the local drugstore, consider leaving the car parked at home and taking the kids with you to accomplish these tasks on foot. Not only does this provide an opportunity for all of you to be physically active, you can also give the children a monetary bonus out of the gas money that you save by walking. In order to help your child address their weight problems, it is absolutely essential for the whole family to participate in a variety of physical activities, like walking, bicycling, or rollerblading, that everyone can enjoy. You can plan special family outings like hiking or skiing, or you can join forces with other families in the neighborhood to play basketball, touch football, soccer, or even hide and go seek. Closer to home, active household duties can be assigned to each family member, such as vacuuming, washing the car, or mowing the lawn, like my son is doing now. If your children express an interest, consider enrolling them in extracurricular activities, like basketball, gymnastics, or swimming that have reasonable time commitments. Cutting back on television viewing or video game playing as a means of reducing sedentary behavior might be a tough sell in the beginning. So start by gradually reducing the time spent in these activities. The key is this. If you can help your children find active alternatives that are enjoyable, they will realize that the process of making lifestyle changes can be a positive experience. Let me share a real life example of how adding small amounts of physical activity to one's daily routine led to visible changes in a child's appearance and his outlook on life. Chad was a young boy who attended my son's elementary school. He was noticeably overweight and experienced difficulty keeping up with the other children during recess and physical education class. He fatigued easily and tried to avoid physical activity whenever possible. His mother became increasingly concerned about Chad's weight 
and decided to make some positive lifestyle changes that would affect them both. Within a month, they had moved out of their house and found an apartment that was much closer to her son's school. They began waking up a few minutes earlier each morning so that she and Chad could ride their bicycles a couple of miles to his school instead of using the car. In addition to this change in physical activity, she also started making healthier food selections at the grocery store and began preparing meals that were noticeably lower in fat content. Within a few months, it was obvious that Chad had dropped a fair amount of weight. When people asked his mother what she had done to help her son lose this weight, she explained that just making a few adjustments in their lifestyle, riding bikes instead of driving, making healthier food selections, and trying to eat in a more healthy manner, all of these small changes had made a huge difference in how both of them looked and felt. What's the moral of this story? I believe it's simply this, that small changes that are carried out and committed to on a daily basis can, over time, lead to positive health outcomes and an improved quality of life. Another important role that parents can play in helping their child lose weight is to model a physically active lifestyle. You don't have to be an excellent athlete or in really, really top-notch condition to be a role model for your child. But they need to see you participating in some form of physical activity on a regular basis, be it walking, jogging, playing basketball, weightlifting, working out in the yard, or, or even jumping up and down on a rebounder if you want. When your children see you enthusiastically embracing an active lifestyle, this will spark their interest in physical activity and speak volumes about how important it is for them to establish healthy physical habits that they can carry with them for the rest of their lives. When kids and parents play together, not only do they receive a good physical workout, they also get the chance to connect emotionally. What children want most is to spend more time with their parents. And sharing physical activity time is a perfect way to make this happen. This type of family bonding can be especially important for the overweight child because it can satisfy their emotional needs and make them less likely to use food as a way of ridding themselves of stress and unhappiness. It is vital for parents to let their children know that they are loved and appreciated, no matter how much they weigh. The good news here is that all children can learn to make healthy lifestyle choices when they receive encouragement and support from their parents. When not at home, children and adolescents spend most of their time at school. It makes sense, therefore, for all of us to support quality school physical education and intramural sports programs that are developmentally appropriate and that emphasize participation in a variety of sport and physical activities. Parents should insist that the physical education programs at their child's school be taught by credentialed physical education teachers whenever possible. In addition, to the health and fitness benefits gained from being in a physical education class, data from a recent study involving over 950,000 children indicate that higher academic achievement is related to improved levels of health-related physical fitness. In other words, the more physically fit children are, the better they perform in school. How much physical activity should children receive? According to guidelines established by the National Association for Sport and Physical Education, school-aged children should accumulate at least 60 minutes and up to several hours of age-appropriate physical activity on all or most days of the week. These guidelines state that physical activity can take place in many short intermittent exercise bouts. It does not need to be performed in the longer, continuous exercise periods that adults often perform. 
Children should participate in a variety of age-appropriate physical activities, such as aerobics, active sports and recreational pursuits, and muscle fitness and flexibility exercises to achieve optimal health, fitness, and performance benefits. This varied approach reduces monotony and increases the likelihood that they will find physical activity fun and enjoyable. It is also recommended that children avoid prolonged periods of inactivity, lasting two hours or more, especially during daylight hours. While our discussion, up to this point at least, has addressed the need to promote health-enhancing physical activity among school-aged children, there has been growing interest in encouraging physical activity in youth under the age of five to counter increasing levels of obesity in preschool children. The position taken by the National Association for Sport and Physical Education on this issue is that all children from birth to age five should engage in daily physical activity that promotes health-related fitness and movement skills. As a member of the task force that wrote this document, it became clear to me how important it is for very young children to safely explore and move about in different environments. With respect to infants, physical activity can promote the development of such basic skills as reaching, grasping, sitting, and crawling. Once walking is possible, a whole new vista of movement and physical activity possibilities emerge for the young child. From the ages of one to four, children begin to acquire the fundamental motor skills that will be the building blocks for more complex movements, such as running, jumping, throwing, and kicking. Hence, it is critical for parents, caregivers, and preschool teachers to provide structured and unstructured physical activity time for children to develop and refine these motor skills. Physical activity is a natural way of preventing and reducing childhood obesity. Therefore, the needs and interests of the child, rather than the desires of adults, should be preeminent in the selection of fitness and sport pursuits. It is also important to remember that whether we're talking about a child or an adult, the process of engaging in physical activity means being involved, doing your best, and participating regularly. Finally, let me again highlight the importance of being an active role model for your child. As a parent of two children, my wife and I try to model many behaviors that we want our children to emulate, honesty, diligence, and respect for others, so that they will be able to function effectively when they become adults. Viewed against this backdrop, modeling physical activity is one of the most enduring legacies that we can leave our children. So in closing, motivate your kids to be active, and until next time, keep moving step by step towards greater health and fitness.